Good afternoon and welcome to the second of the Tanfield Talks. The question posed in the title to this talk, the end of the KSD notice to quit, arises from the decision last year of Secretary of State and Spencer in which I appeared. Mr Justice Burss held that an agricultural tenant served with a notice to quit under KSD or Schedule 3 to the Agricultural Holdings Act 1986 could rely on equitable set-off of unliquidated claims for damages in order to invalidate it. What may be less well known is that the Secretary of State sought and was granted permission to appeal to the Court of Appeal by Lord Justice Lewison. Whilst that appeal was not pursued for reasons which I'm unable to elaborate on, it does not mean that this is the end of the story. In this webinar, we will look at the decision, some of the practical consequences and consider whether there is scope for challenge. So let us start by looking at Case D itself. The relevant parts of Case D for these purposes are as follows. At the date of the giving of the notice to quit, the tenant had failed to comply with a notice in writing served on him by the landlord. And that notice being a notice requiring him within two months from the service of the notice to pay any rent due in respect of the agricultural holding to which the notice to quit relates. And it is stated in the notice to quit that it is given by reason of the said matter. It is worth reminding oneself of the nature of case D. The scheme under case D is not a scheme for enforcement. It is a scheme for termination of the tenancy. And it isn't the existence of the arrears of rent which provides the basis for termination. Rather, it is the tenant's failure to comply with the notice to pay which provides the basis for termination of the tenancy. So the purpose of the notice to pay under case D is to tell the tenant precisely what he must do in order to avoid the loss of his tenancy. And that was held in the case of Mason and Biscarwin by Mr Justice Lewison. A notice to pay is invalid and ineffective if it overstates the amount of rent due by even a very small amount. And there is no provision for the tenant to justify why rent has not been paid and no ability for the tenant to apply for anything akin to relief from forfeiture. So in order to defeat the notice to quit, the tenant must prove either that he has paid the whole of the amount stated in the notice to pay within the statutory two month window, or that the notice to pay itself was inaccurate in that as a matter of fact, it specified a greater amount of rent than was in fact due. As has been mentioned in the commentaries, the draconian penalty imposed by the case D procedure, if rent is not paid, suggests that landlords were intended to enjoy considerable protection in relation to rent, in contrast with the other very serious restrictions on a landlord's ability to recover possession. So let us look at the factual background to the case of uh, Spencer. Now, this case has a very long and complicated history, and the parties have been involved in litigation for some considerable time and indeed continue to do so. But for these purposes, we need only look at a small part of the factual background. The Secretary of State for Defence uh, is the landlord of Chalston Farm in Wiltshire. And back in September 2004, uh, an arbitrator uh, awarded an increase in the annual rent, but the tenants did not pay uh, that increased rent. The Secretary of State served a notice to pay requiring the tenants to pay the outstanding rent 
they again failed to pay any rent and did not comply with the notice to pay. And so the Secretary of State served a notice to quit pursuant to case D on the basis of that failure. The tenants demanded arbitration in 2005, challenging the grounds for giving the notice to quit. And an arbitrator was appointed um, in July of that year. The tenants contended that the notice to quit was invalid for five reasons. Um, by an interim award, the arbitrator determined the first of three issues in the Se Secretary of State's favour. Now, issues uh, D and E, uh, the, so the final two issues, are the ones which are relevant to this appeal, um, namely that the notice to pay overstated the rent due because the tenants had a right of set off, being damages arising from breach or alleged breach of the Secretary of State's repairing obligations um, and unlawful conduct. The arbitrator in 2015 um, asked the court to resolve a preliminary issue of law. I, sh I should add that there were various other appeals on different matters before that date, hence the uh, delay in the case being stated to the court. But the arbitrator asked the court to decide on an issue of law, which is whether the tenants could rely upon an equitable set off of unliquidated claims for damages in order to invalidate the notice to pay and in turn render the notice to quit invalid. This uh, was by way of the old case stated procedure under Schedule 11, because of course this arbitration actually started before 2006. In November 2016, uh, Recorder Norman uh, declared that the tenants could rely on an equitable set off in order to defeat a notice to pay and thus the notice to quit, but subject to certain conditions. Um, <clears throat> now, the matter was appealed, actually appealed by both the landlord and uh, tenant, and um, Mr. Justice Burse upheld the decision of Recorder Norman, and he held that Parliament intended to require that any rent due stated in a notice to pay must be the rent net of any claim by the tenant against the landlord, so long as prior to the date of the notice to pay, First, the claim set off in equity has been asserted expressly in reduction or extinction of the rent claimed by the landlord in the notice of rent to pay. Secondly, that the claim has been quantified. And thirdly, that both the assertion and the quantification of the claim were bona fide and on reasonable grounds. Now, if those requirements are met, then an equitable set off can be relied upon in reduction of the rent due as at the date of the notice to pay to the extent of the quantification of that claim. Thus, this is how case D paragraph A to the 90, of Schedule uh, 3 to the Agricultural Holdings Act is to be now interpreted. The uh, tenant uh, did in fact appeal against the imposition of the criteria, so appealed against the decision record in Norman, um, but that was dismissed by Mr Justice Burse, and there was no attempt by the attempt to seek permission from the Court of Appeal of that decision. But now that the Secretary of State has withdrawn the appeal, we are left with this High Court authority on case D and set off. At first sight, one might consider that the criteria are sufficiently onerous to allay a landlord's concerns. But there are, in fact, quite serious practical consequences of this decision. Admittedly, not all 1986 Act tenancies will be affected by the decision. If there is a no set off clause in the tenancy, that will preclude the tenant from being able to rely on the equitable set off to render a notice to pay invalid. But it does impact on those that have an impact on those tenancies without a no set off clause. Bearing in mind 
there will always be farms where, for example, there are buildings, almost some will be out of repair. So a tenant faced with a potential notice to pay only needs to refer to an arguable claim for damages arising from breach of the tenancy, however small, to render the notice to pay and in turn the notice to quit invalid. And that is how he will be advised. Now, there are other practical cons consequences to consider here. There is no limitation on the reliance of equitable set off. So potentially, the landlord could be looking at very old claims being made by the tenant to defeat his current notice to pay. The arbitrator also has no jurisdiction to determine the tenant's claims, and there's no power to force the tenant to bring the claim to court to decide whether there is actually a valid claim. So a landlord could very well be stuck without being able to rely on the case D scheme. So is there any scope for challenging what is now the authority on case D? Now, in the High Court appeal, a number of arguments were raised, not all of which were actually addressed in the decision or addressed in the decision at length. I will look at uh, three areas in this webinar, albeit there were other grounds of appeal for which permission was granted. The critical issue is what is meant by any rent due in case D. And the landlord's case under uh, regarding any rent due was that that must mean a sum less than or equal to the amount of rent which a tenant was bound contractually to have paid to the landlord on or by the relevant date specified in the notice to pay, but has not yet been paid. And it doesn't allow for deemed netting off of any amount unless it is subject of a formal claim by the tenant and subject to agreement or judgment on liability and quantum. Of course, the landlord failed on the appeal in that respect. Now, reliance was placed both by Recorder Norman and Mr Justice Burse on the Scottish case of Alexander and Royal Hotel Keith Ness and over to Dicta in Sloan Stanley and Barable. The Scottish case of Alexander uh, considered the equivalent to the case D provisions in Scottish law. And in Alexander, the Court of Session had uh, held that the rent was not due if the tenant was entitled to retain it. And money was only due if the debtor was under an enforceable obligation to pay. Mr Justice Burse considered, therefore, that a landlord was not allowed to claim the sum due if he was not entitled to recover the rent by way of legal proceedings. He said uh, very briefly that the distinction between Scottish law and English law did not justify a different conclusion. I would humbly suggest that this is wrong and one reason is that Mr Justice Burse allies the recovery of sums by way of legal proceedings with the rent due and a notice to pay. Alexander was dependent on the concept of mutuality of obligations. That is a Scottish concept that neither party may enforce its terms against the other whilst himself being in breach of obligation. So a tenant is entitled to retain his rent unless and until the landlord's breach is remedied. There is no equivalent at common law in England, and indeed that was recognised by Lord Gill in Alexander. In English law, a tenant is legally entitled to withhold rent so as to be able to say that the sum is not due by way of rent in only certain limited circumstances. In short, where rent is deemed not to be due either under contract or statute, where there has been a tender of the liquidated sum before action, 
where the tenant has carried out works of repair, which are the responsibility of the landlord, or where the tenant has paid money at the request of the landlord in respect of some obligation of the landlord connected to the land demise. And arguably, where the tenant is entitled, pursuant to the statutes of set off, having paid out goings on the property, which was the landlord's obligation to pay. Now, Mr. Justice uh, Burst could be said to have wrongly followed the decision and reasoning of the Court of Session in Alexander, because he failed to recognise the full significance of that fundamental distinction between Scottish and English law on the material question as to whether a tenant is entitled as a matter of law to withhold rent on grounds of a landlord's breach, in this case, breach of repairing obligation. So, although under English law, an equitable set off could have the effect of preventing the landlord from recovering the rent due, under case D, the landlord is neither suing for rent nor levying distress. The landlord is seeking to rely upon a common law right to terminate the tenancy by notice to quit, arising from the fact that the tenants have failed to comply with the notice to pay. Um, the uh, remarks of Lord Justice Balcom in Sloan Stanley, uh, a state trustee and variable, uh, namely that a, a notice to pay could potentially be defeated by an equitable set off, were over to. And in fact, that case was quite different to the case in Spencer. Um, the tenant there sought to set off payments of drainage rates for which he was entitled under statute to an indemnity from the landlord. The Court of Appeal had held that the tenant actually couldn't in any event rely on his statutory right because he had not actually, in fact, made any payment of the rents and his rights were contingent on that basis. But if the tenant had paid, he would have been entitled to treat himself as discharged in respect of the equivalent amount of rent due. So in other words, a tenant cannot rely on a contingent future right of set off to defeat a notice uh, to pay. There is no Court of Appeal authority for the proposition that self-help equitable set off can be relied on in the landlord and tenant field. Which brings me on to the next area of challenge on the next slide. The um, judgment failed to take into account that, save for one exception, the concept of equitable set off in the area of landlord and tenant has only arisen in the context of legal proceedings. The uh, case of British and Sani um, and international marine management is authority for the proposition that landlord or tenant is entitled in court proceedings to rely upon an equitable defence of set off to a claim by the other party arising out of the relationship of landlord and tenant. But what this judgment in Spencer appears to do is to extend the principle of equitable set off in the field of landlord and tenant. The remedy of self-help equitable set off has been recognised in the context of general commercial contracts in order to suspend contractual remedies such as to terminate the contract. And I cited there two cases, Federal Navigation Company and Molina. Um, and also the case of Ferns and Anglo-Dutch Paint and Chemical Company Limited. And that uh, latter case is actually quite important in the case of Spencer because the criteria imposed for the availability of set off in the decision of Recorder Norman and upheld by Mr Justice First are derived from the decision in Ferns. But it is um, argued that the remedy of self-help equitable set off is not available to tenants, save possibly in the context of the levy of distress. A landlord is entitled to the rent as owner of the reversion and not merely as a debt. And it's um, contended that the rent is not discharged by the mere existence of a potential equitable set off. All the authorities on equitable set off in the landlord and tenant context, save one exception, are litigation cases rather than self help cases. The one exception is the case of Fuller and Happy Shopper Markets, and this was a decision of Mr Justice Lightman at first instance, 
in which he held that a self-help equitable set-off rendered a prior completed levy unlawful. However, that too was a recovery of rent case by distress. In contrast, case D is a scheme for termination of the tenancy. The use of self-help equitable set-off is problematic in landlord and tenant cases, even with the limiting criteria of funds, because there is no means by which the valid validity, much less the quantum of the claim, can be established at the point at which the landlord seeks to exercise its contractual other rights for non-payment. And the relationship, or the landlord and tenant relationship, tends to last much longer than most commercial contracts, including charter parties. In the case D situation, the landlord is not suing for the rent. It is not even levying distress. It is simply relying upon the common law right to terminate the tenancy by notice to quit without having to obtain the consent of the tribunal to do so. The um, judgment held that the imposition of criteria limiting the ability of the tenant to rely on an equitable set of gave effect to the intention of Parliament in providing for a scheme for the recovery of possession in the case of renteries, and it addressed the concerns of the, a landlord. But the statutory scheme is not a scheme of enforcement, but a scheme of termination. And the scheme of incontestable notices to quit does not allow for equitable relief after a notice to quit has been served, only a contest as to the factual basis for the case relied on. The statutory scheme is plainly intended to give the landlord a way to avoid the complexities of forfeiture and court proceedings. Set off as an equitable defence to a legal claim is a matter of equitable discretion and it doesn't readily fall, um, in my view, within the jurisdiction of a statutory arbitrator. In particular, an arbitrator appointed to determine whether or not a notice to pay under case D paragraph A is valid and effective has, as I've said before, no jurisdiction to entertain or determine a counterclaim, either as to liability or quantum. So, um, in my view, the criteria doesn't really cure the problems raised by the practical consequences of the judgment. So finally, in answer to the question posed at the beginning, whilst it's not the end of case D, and it may be that the criteria will serve a purpose in some cases, there will no doubt be landlords who are unable to use case D as a means of recovering possession. Now that the Secretary of State has withdrawn the appeal, we are left with this as the only decision in England on case D and settle. But it seems to me that uh, this is an issue which needs to be decided by the Court of Appeal. And some comfort um, can be drawn from the fact that uh, Lord Justice Lewison granted permission on this second appeal, considering it had great real prospects of success and that it raised an important point of principle. As I said, I have only touched on some areas, but it may be that some of you will have questions. Uh, I suggest, uh, if you wish, you can drop me uh, an email and um, I'll endeavour to elucidate. In the meantime, thank you uh, for listening to this short talk and I wish you a good afternoon and hope you're able to enjoy this sunny weather. Thank you.